want to welcome everybody to our weekly cyber policy center at lunch. Uh, we are honored today to have uh, Tim Long, uh, who is currently the general counsel of Substack, uh, but is speaking here in his capacity as a research fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Uh, however, he has had many affiliations, academic and otherwise, running the uh, uh, ethics and policy on um, AI initiative that was a Harvard MIT uh, partnership. And uh, uh, one of my favorite affiliations of his is that he started the website, the California Review of Images and Mark Zuckerberg, which is all the uh, sort of the images of Mark Zuckerberg in various uh, settings. Uh, he'll be talking today about uh, microeconomics of uh, disinformation. Uh, and if you remember this, you can walk. Uh, thanks to the Cyber Policy Center and Nick for having me. Um, as mentioned, my name is Tim Huang, and the talk today is entitled The Microeconomics of Disinformation. Um, yeah, it's, I haven't been traveling for COVID, so this is a real pleasure to be like back in the same room with everybody and really looking forward to the discussion. So today will be a little bit of a... Oh, can we get the slides up, actually? Oh, they're up. Ah, yeah. oh, great. Perfect. Um, uh, so today will be a little bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the research I've been working on for the last few years that really look at the incentives of actors that engage in disinformation efforts. Um, and so I'll give a little bit of a framing of the motivation uh, of the work uh, and then just talk a little bit about a couple of the projects uh, that I've been involved in um, uh, in exploring this particular kind of uh, topic. Um, Given all the great people in the room, I want to make sure that we have time for discussion. And uh, in some ways, I want to kind of use this as an opportunity to get a bunch of ideas from the audience. Uh, as you'll see, the research agenda is quite wide, um, and I think there's a lot of directions for it to run. And so in some ways, I'm kind of looking for the audience in some ways to help uh, me think through some of the issues uh, that I'll present here today. So plan is, as per usual for these lunches, that I'll talk for about uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll go to Q&A and discussion. So uh, if we could go ahead and uh, advance to the next slide. Or we don't see it showing up here, is it? No. Oh, is it different? Sorry. Ah, great. Perfect. So a little bit by way of introduction, um, as mentioned, uh, I actually come to these topics a little bit as a uh, as a practitioner. Uh, so back in 2010, Twitter was very new, and me and a couple of friends said, hey, wouldn't it be really interesting if you could have bots that would go on social media to engage people in conversations online? And so for a period of time, we were running what we called sort of like battle bots, but sociable. Uh, teams would write bots that would emerge on social media, uh, and we would score teams based on how effectively they were uh, at writing automated systems that would be uh, engaging to people. So we'd say, oh, you got someone to retweet you, great, you got three points. Um, and we ran these sort of series of competitions over time. And kind of one of the most remarkable things that we sort of discovered, you know, uh, more than a decade ago was just the ability for automated systems to be able to shape social activity online. Uh, it may amuse some of you to learn that, uh, you know, we were very optimistic about this technology. Uh, one of our thoughts was, oh, well, you know, people encounter all this misinformation, disinformation online. Wouldn't it be great if you had these bots that could go online and help counter this stuff? Um, used to say this is by and large not been the use of the technology over the past decade. But this is really how it comes to the topic. A lot of people come to disinformation from a, a legal background or a social science background. Uh, I really come to it from a practitioner, basically sitting with a bunch of people saying, how do we launch a bunch of fake accounts on Twitter and how difficult uh, is it to do that? And so that might help to inform, you know, I think one view that I have on the kind of current state of the discourse uh, around disinformation and, and what we do about it. Um, uh, I watched very closely the kind of discourse that emerged around the threat posed by deepfakes. So if you haven't been kind of in this discourse, the background is that machine learning is unlocking these really powerful ways to simulate realistic faces and voices. Uh, and the concern is basically that this is going to completely change the disinformation game. We're going to be awash in these advanced deepfakes. No one will really know what's true or what's not, uh, and democracy will sort of dissolve. Um, and this was a big part of the kind of media narrative about this and a lot of discussion uh, around this new te technological capability. And, you know, I put here, this is sort of when speculative red teaming goes wrong in some ways, that this is in many ways, I think, a, a real common pattern um, in the discussion around disinformation and the threats posed uh, by these types of tactics and campaigns online, uh, which is that a tendency is to basically sit in a room and say, okay, there's this new capability out there. Machine learning is making it possible to create believable faces. Uh, let's just speculate widely about how this technology could be used. And so the tendency is to basically uh, often react to threats that don't end up being threats uh, and to ignore threats that really end up being big issues, right? And part of this is that, you know, that uh, we are sort of red teaming 
uh, without really particularly grounded vision of uh, how you actually go about executing on this technology. Um, and so one paper that I've done sort of for uh, CSET uh, is really an analysis that basically says, okay, well, before we, we worry about deep fakes, uh, we should perhaps just take a look at what it takes to create one of these fakes, right? Is it hard? How much time does it take? How much data do you need? And from that, do our threat assessment, right? Kind of a one brain cell way of looking at it. But I think we often kind of skip to what's the doomsday scenario in disinformation. And I think in some ways, as someone who, you know, is basically just trying to figure out how you get bots up on Twitter repeatedly, um, my thinking always goes to, okay, so like how much does that cost? Is it difficult? Uh, what are the alternatives, right, for faking this type of content? And I think this ends up being a very sort of powerful way ultimately at looking at it. Um, me and a couple of friends always joke that in some ways, uh, we're always talking about the masterminds of disinformation, uh, but I have a lot of empathy for like the middle manager at the Russian internet research agency, right? So like, this is not the guy who's making campaign decisions. He's the guy who's like in the middle that's like, I gotta put together a slide deck to show these dashboards on how successful our campaign is. Uh, and like, how do I maximize the budget that I've been given to create the maximal amount of disruption? Right. And, you know, this deep fake research kind of got me into the mode of thinking more about like what this what this guy does. Right. Like, what are their incentives? What are they doing? What are they paying attention to? And really what ultimately influences uh, their decision making? And, um, well, you know, one way of thinking about this is that, you know, ultimately, this is where the rubber meets the road. Right. We can talk a lot about deep fakes. We can talk a lot about next generation disinformation campaigns. But sort of if this middle manager doesn't make the choice to say, yes, you know, we're going to launch 10,000 bots and here's how we're going to do it, it kind of never materializes on the ground. And so the critique I'm making or the sort of motivation for a lot of my research is to simply say that, you know, while we normally think of what you might think of as uh, the macroeconomics of disinformation, right, we have a lot of people talking about the future of democracy and what is truth and what are facts, uh, we frequently forget about this middle manager guy, right, uh, and what I would think of as really the microeconomic view. We talk a lot about the sort of structural factors that influence this information, uh, but not so much of, you know, how much does it cost to launch a bot, right? And I think those really quite boring facts uh, end up playing a very big role in defining the contours of these campaigns and how they're likely to evolve um, in the future. And so um, this is basically the kind of root of the research agenda I've been chasing after. And kind of what I want to do for, you know, really the remainder of the talk is just kind of talk about how the component pieces of this are all sort of coming together. Uh, and what I think ultimately this microeconomic view can offer um, in a way that I think a lot of the sort of what, if you will, macroeconomic discussions around sort of disinformation, truth online, the post-truth era uh, will ultimately fail to resolve. And, and I think what I want to convince you of here today is that this microeconomic view is where we should be putting a lot more of our chips. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of people working in this space, but I think this is sort of a rallying cry that sort of, you know, Michael Scott at sort of the Dunder Mifflin of disinformation uh, is really going to know what's going to be coming next uh, versus uh, a broad conclusion about what is truth uh, in some absolute term. All right, so I think the first part of this research agenda has been to simply figure out how do you simulate adversaries that have different levels of technical sophistication? Um, and we've built a little bit of uh, an engine to go about achieving this, and I kind of want to walk you through a little bit how it works and, and what we seem to or uh, aim to achieve uh, in doing this kind of work. So uh, many of you may uh, be a user or have been confronted with a Calendly link. Um, obviously, this is a major piece of organizational infrastructure for many companies, organizations, nonprofits, and universities. Um, and you know, say we want to run a very simple question about attacking this kind of infrastructure. Uh, the nice thing about Calendly is that anyone can put something on your calendar. Uh, so me and a couple of friends simply said, OK, well, what happens if we just write a script, a script to basically bomb someone's calendar? right? How, what happens if we drop lots and lots and lots of calendar invites through Calendly, and will the system break? More importantly, what we want to do is to try to figure out uh, whether or not the system is robust to certain kinds of attacks and different levels of sophistication in these attacks. So one way of thinking about it a little bit is um, to return to the original case that I talked about. If you're trying to create bots on Twitter, um, one of the things you can do is you can simply uh, have a bunch of bots that go try to do this, right? And pretty quickly, what you find is that Twitter says, oh, um, all of these bot requests are coming out of the same IP, right? We're going to blacklist that IP, your operations are shut down. And so that's maybe one level of sophistication, right? The actor is one that is simply trying to create a bunch of spam without really hiding their activity, 
Next level up, we can say, okay, well, maybe to avoid Twitter's detection or Calendly's detection, we're going to come out sort of Twitter, Twitter from a couple of different directions. So, you know, we might be able to simulate uh, traffic going through different proxies, right? The idea here is uh, we don't want Twitter to know that one computer or one IP is the source of all these bots. So we'll try to obfuscate traffic. One of the things you find there is that a lot of services will say, okay, well, you know, this is coming through a bunch of different IPs, but it really kind of looks like all of these uh, automated scripts aren't real computers. They're not real devices, right? And again, maybe that blocks actors with another level of sophistication. Uh, a third level that we're really interested in is to say, okay, well then maybe what you do is you fake um, a device, right? So another level of sophistication up. And so uh, to return to Calendly, that's a little bit of what we want to do here, but you can kind of imagine this general approach applying in a number of different cases, which is that we can come up with sort of the technical sophistication that a crude actor would have, sort of a medium level actor would have, and sort of like a more sophisticated actor would have. If we can do that, what we can do is we can start directly testing each of these services to see how they break and how they do under pressure. Um, it turns out if you want to play along at home, uh, that Calendly is like not very well defended, right? You can basically just pour lots and lots and lots of calendar invites onto someone's calendar. This is kind of a fun toy case, but reveals kind of the, the example that I'm talking about, right? Is that you could apply this to any kind of service, right? This is uh, calendar invites here, but could be fake accounts elsewhere. Uh, it could be uh, attacks to manipulate the content recommendation algorithm on a platform. And what's really under, running under the hood is what you see sort of on the left. Uh, which is that we can basically run a couple of different actors uh, and give them very different technical configurations, right? We can say, okay, you have this much money to spend on this campaign. Here's how much uh, uh, amount of money you're willing to spend on bandwidth, right? Like proxies. Um, here's how smart you are about simulating a real like laptop or computer connecting to a service. And this is all sort of mix and match. So the idea here is that we can basically batch out a huge number of different adversaries doing in some ways sampling campaigns against particular services. And the notion here is really to kind of figure out uh, sort of in some ways, if you want to return to the microeconomic view, what are the incentives that operate on an actor? What are the costs that they face, right? Uh, you know, we, this really rapidly kind of resolves to this dollar and cents analysis, right? Which is, okay, uh, is it easier for me to generate 10,000 accounts on Twitter or is it easier to generate them myself, right? Uh, if I'm going to purchase them, how expensive will they be? Right. And really what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create what's in effect kind of an internet research agency in a box. The idea that you can basically like simulate a bunch of these attacks and get a lot of data about what are the sort of incentives uh, that those actors face. So that's, I think, ultimately the first part of the picture. Now, the other part of the picture, though, is that uh, a lot of the incentives on these actors don't just depend on like their, the people themselves or the actors themselves, right? So, you know, if you are an enterprising disinformation actor, uh, you've got things like budget, you've got things like labor costs, you've got things like, you know, how many machine learning engineers you could hire, but you also face uh, an environment where you have alternatives. Um, so one of the flaws, I think, in a lot of the discourse around deepfakes um, was that, you know, everybody imagined that people would be creating deep fakes just in-house in some ways. Um, and they really didn't stop to consider the idea that, you know, ultimately these actors have uh, open source alternatives they could rely on, right? And in fact, one way of thinking about it is that as the costs of those open source alternatives decline, right, it may make these tactics more or less attractive. So this is in some ways the complement to what we've been talking about here, right? The example I just gave here is kind of a fun toy example, but it just gives us a lot of data about, okay, if I were going to break the system, I were going to launch my own disinformation effort, here's the costs that I would face. The other part of it is, I think, to understand sort of the environment as a whole, right? And what are the opportunities that a bad actor might face? And to be able to price those opportunities really, really effectively. So let me make that a little bit more concrete, right? If it takes $2 to create a fake account on Twitter by yourself, but you can purchase a pretty good one for $1, right? You will see uh, campaigns because they're pragmatists tend to invest in sort of outsourcing of these operations, right? But if the costs are different, you would build them in-house, right? So again, nothing particularly complicated, but I think these really kind of granular facts end up being really key in sort of understanding the shape uh, that these efforts uh, take. So, let me talk a little bit about sort of another experiment that is now getting at kind of like the, the outside world, right? Understanding sort of the incentives at the world at large. Um, this is a, a little bit of a, a emerging project that we have right now, uh, looking specifically into voice uh, synthesis. Um, so this is kind of the, the audio version of the deep fake threat. So a lot of people say, okay, we're worried about people being able to simulate faces and video, uh, but what if somebody was just able to simulate voices, right? What could you do with that? And again, the sort of like 
pointy headed microeconomic view of this is to say, okay, well, what we should do is we should try every single like sort of deep voice uh, uh, simulator out in the open source and just test basically how expensive it is and how quickly you can use it to generate a believable voice. So if you're familiar a little bit with the machine learning here, you essentially have to train this system over a period of time um, to get to a certain level of quality. And so this is a chart from one of the more popular uh, open source frameworks. But all we're kind of doing here is to basically just say, uh, across lots and lots of training that takes a certain amount of time, what's the quality that we get? And the two questions that we're looking for here is like, how, do you, how quickly do we get to a high level of quality? And then what's the kind of top out at the ceiling end? Um, again, this ends up being really important, and we've ultimately got a project that we want to launch, which will be sort of an observatory for the open source packages. So it is to run this very rudimentary analysis on as many open source packages as possible to try to figure out, okay, what is the, in some ways, the market price for audio synthesis? And from that, the hope is basically to say, okay, how quickly are those costs declining? When does it become good enough, cheap enough, and fast enough that we will start to see it in the field? Um, and again, this is just sort of the collection of relatively rudimentary facts, but I think critical ones to sort of understanding um, how a campaign uh, evolves and takes shape. All right, so you may be wondering then where this all goes. And I think the two pieces of it sort of come together in sort of a third bit of the sort of research agenda that I've been chasing after, which is to really combine the two, right? To basically say, okay, we know a lot about sort of the in-house economics, if you will, uh, of a disinformation effort. And we're starting to understand what the sort of external economics of it are, right? What are the opportunities? How expensive are various things? What can we buy off the shelf versus having to build? Um, and the hope is to actually put them both together, right? That we can actually use this data to start coming up with formal models that look more and more a little bit like what you see in sort of an economics discussion um, to kind of predict how disinformation campaigns will operate in the future. Um, so I'll walk you through an example of that that we've been chasing after so you can see a little bit of how that looks. Um, this is a really interesting discussion that's emerging right now in this very, very, very nerdy, narrow world of sort of machine learning and disinformation, uh, which is about the threat of something that's called sort of counter forensics. Uh, there's a professor, uh, Matt Stam at Drexel, who works on this. And the basic premise is, okay, in the future, you're going to have deep fakes emerging online. Turns out you can use machine learning systems to detect whether or not something is a deep fake or not, right? So that's kind of the second round of the game. You have a new threat and then people come up with ways of defending it. Uh, Matt and his collaborators basically say, okay, well, what we're gonna have actually is the third generation, which is counter forensics, right? That I essentially can, knowing that you're gonna try to detect me using a machine learning detection system, sort of seed the content that I release in ways that actively defeat that machine learning detection, right? And so this is sort of the cat and mouse game that you see emerging in a lot of kind of these types of tactics. And Matt himself will admit, he's basically like, this works in the lab right now. I don't know if anyone's actually using it out there in the world. And I think this is the place where a kind of microeconomic approach can be really helpful, right? Because what we wanna know is we've come up with something cool in the lab. Like when might bad actors start adopting this, right? And what kinds of actors might start adopting it? And what are the drivers uh, on this decision-making ultimately, right? And what I wanna do is basically shift away from the kinds of red teaming that we had in the deepfake discussion, something that looks a little bit more like this. So rather than basically sitting in a room and saying, wow, election 2020, I really imagine that deepfakes could happen, we can start making falsifiable predictions, right? The strength of this model will simply be, I think counter forensics will be practical in Q3 2024, judge me against that. And I think that kind of mode is really, really helpful in kind of pushing ahead sort of our thinking of what we can do around it. Uh, and so this is effectively what we've done. Um, and then I guess I'll queue up uh, the uh, uh, version that we've done here. So I'll show you basically something really, really simple that we've built in a, a little kind of framework called Streamlit that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, let me just share a screen really quickly. All right. So this is how all the pieces uh, start to come together a little bit. Apologies, like many kind of research projects in motion, the minute you look at it initially, it's just a mess. Uh, so it's probably better for me to just explain kind of what's going on. Um, so what we think about in thinking about whether or not bad actors will adopt this new technology counter forensics is to kind of think about what are the incentives that act on the, the disinformation firm. Um, and the way we model it is a little bit of a race, basically, between how quickly people are adopting machine learning detection and how uh, profitable it is, if you will, uh, to implement counter forensics. So the concept here is, okay, I'm an enterprising disinformation actor. I want to release disinformation on social media. 
Um, and you can imagine basically that, okay, over time it gets more difficult because social media platforms like Facebook and Google uh, are implementing sort of filtration mechanisms. So I can release a deep fake today. It may reach a smaller audience than it does in the future, uh, in part because these platforms have countermeasures that they are implementing. And the choice of whether or not to implement sort of counter forensics, right? That is to say tools that actively defeat this kind of detection is gonna be based on sort of the price of reaching that audience. So I say, okay, well, I've got, you know, $100,000 that I can spend on the campaign. Do I want to spend another $50,000 to access all these people that are being sort of protected, if you will, uh, by these automated detection systems? Um, and the way we think about it a little bit is, okay, uh, that price is going down on one hand because the techniques are getting cheaper and cheaper. And then more and more people are sort of being protected by these detection systems. And so it ends up being like very much if you have kind of even sort of like a basic economics background, this kind of very simple calculation, this very simple trade-off that essentially looks at how quickly are the costs coming down? How big is the audience that's being protected by this stuff? And then when is it worth it on a cost per audience basis for me to implement these types of techniques? And so this is kind of a chart showing the, the purple is basically more and more people being covered um, by sort of uh, machine learning based detection. Um, and then we basically look on the second chart here on sort of the cost for accessing an audience. So we basically model this as disinformation actors saying, okay, at a certain point, it's just so cheap to access so many people. Why wouldn't I want to implement counter forensics? Now, the fun part about this is that this is just kind of modeling a specific scenario. But what we can do is we can start running this in kind of Monte Carlo fashion. Um, again and again and again, right? And so from these assumptions, we can basically start to say, okay, when does disinformation or counter forensics end up being in budget for a disinformation campaign? That's the blue. Those are scenarios in which that occurs. And then when do we figure out that they're gonna be likely to be adopted because the economics make sense? And again, this is nothing really sophisticated, but you run these scenarios and you start to start to see, okay, we can actually start making pretty concrete predictions about when we think things are gonna happen. Now, there's two things I'll add to this, right? One of them is, of course, that the strength of this kind of modeling depends a lot on the assumptions, right? And that's the reason why we're doing a lot of the homework that I talked about earlier in the talk, right? Is that we can actually just start getting the data on, here's how expensive it is to do this, right? And the second part is, I think that you should practically look at this and say, well, Tim, this is a very nice graph, but does this actually correspond to reality? But the nice thing about this is, as against a lot of the red teaming that goes down, um, this provides uh, an actual sort of set of bets that we can make. Right. And we can actually offer this uh, to two types of groups of people ultimately. I think one of them is certainly policymakers who want to know when do these capabilities become a threat. Uh, and the other one is to really offer this to sort of civil society and people who are working on research, right? To say, okay, it's not just when you need to be dealing with counter forensics, but on what time scale ends up being important, right? Because you might say, sit there and say, I'm a government funder, I'm the National Science Foundation, right? Do I want to put money into solving this problem right now? or do I want to solve another problem in the space? And I think these types of models are really powerful at getting some intuitions uh, around uh, those types uh, of decisions, ultimately. Uh, so Ben, I think we can go back to the slides that worked. Yeah, and I'll stop the screen. So where does this all go uh, ultimately? Um, I think there's uh, a general framework that I'm trying to build up here, um, and maybe we'll end on this thought and we'd love to kind of get into the discussion with everybody here, uh, which is that in economics, you have what's known as the theory of the firm. The idea here is if you understand sort of the internal incentives uh, of, of an organization and also sort of its external incentives that are operating on it, uh, you can predict the, the behavior of what that firm is doing, right? Nothing particularly complicated. And the hope is to really create a theory of the disinformation firm, right? So by collecting all this data about how operations work internally and externally, uh, we can start answering a number of really sort of interesting questions in my mind, right? So one of them is, this is really funny if anyone has taken a business school course, you find that a lot of disinformation actors have to decide whether or not to build things in-house versus outsourcing. Uh, and I am very, very sort of interested on like that buy-build dilemma in the disinformation space. I think that has so many much to do with sort of the costs that these organizations face and really what that middle manager is trying to achieve. A second one is basically a deep fake case. Uh, why do actors choose to adopt new capabilities versus stick with old cheap ones, right? One view on why deep fakes will sort of perhaps never become that big of an issue in the political domain is that it ends up being just cheaper to spread disinformation with methods that don't require machine learning. And then the final one, which is really interesting, is also thinking about why actors engage in these activities in the first place, right? 
um, you know, one of the differences you can say is, okay, in a commercial or criminal setting, uh, you're really trying to maximize profit, right? And maybe that changes the incentives versus a political actor that may just have a fixed budget that they want to spend. And one of the things that we're kind of trying to operationalize in our model is basically like, what's the, uh, what's the budget uncertainty that the internet research agency faces, right? Is the next quarter, do, do, do those middle managers worry about having their budgets cut? It's kind of a silly question to ask, but I think really critical in thinking about, you know, even how state actors uh, will make decisions uh, going forwards. So hopefully that was a helpful kind of whirlwind tour of sort of what I've been up to. Um, here is my sort of contact information uh, and looking very much forward to the discussion. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, and I got to we got to move, we have to right. move this. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put this right in front of you here. Uh, because it's the microphone for the Zoom. Yeah. Um, and the 150 people on Zoom, uh, please uh, put in your questions and then we'll be emailed to me on my trusty <laughs> disinformation device here. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, uh, please raise your hand and, and if you're in the room and, and have a question. Let, let me start with this kind of broad question, which is, um, are you focusing on a particular slice of the disinformation problem? Because one question might be that if I have a large following on Twitter, mm -hmm. this information is really costless, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, so that that you know whether it's a presidential candidate or or an actual leader or or a publication, um, that that seems to be orthogonal to what I think you're you're talking about here. Um, and in many ways, if the disinformation problem is a lot about people who have influence already, then uh, propagating out how should we think about the microeconomics of disinformation uh, in that context? Yeah, definitely. So I definitely think it's applicable. I mean, what I'm arguing here is really like a general approach, right? Which is that often we've kind of taken the view implicitly that the disinformation problem, quote unquote, is kind of a, like an irrational problem, right? And I think the counter here is to say, actually, in many cases, these actors are quite rational in how they weigh their incentives and take their actions. And I think that this kind of approach is really helpful, even in thinking about people who already have a big audience. Um, it very quickly kind of resolves to the sort of marketing based discussion, right? which is like, what's your cost of acquisition? What's your cost of influence? Um, I think one of the most interesting things in thinking about established audiences, right, is how long does it take to build that audience? And what's the cost of cutting that person off from their audience? So I am very interested in saying, okay, well, you know, if you lose access to a platform where you've built a huge audience, how long and how expensive is it to build one at parity on another platform, right? That's incredibly valuable for thinking about the long-term effect of something like deplatforming, uh, but something that I don't think we've really like dug, dug super into. And so, you know, I think it's relevant to the case where even there is established audiences, uh, but I think some of the questions you might ask are, are a little bit different. So th this model is not even really really about disinformation per se, like mm -hmm. this is about communication, right? Sure. It's, it's about, it, it could be about, this could be advice for me trying to sell my product too, right? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, I mean, maybe there's a surreptitiousness mm -hmm. element to this that, that we care about, but it's, it's really about how to gain an audience and to propagate your message. That's right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't want to oversell it, right? Like I'm engaging in a very classic academic strategy, which is like arbitrage, yeah, right. right? Which is like, there's like a lot of basic frameworks that other fields have come up with that end up being like very applicable to this discussion. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the question of like legitimate versus illegitimate actors does change some of the incentives that take place, right? So, you know, one way of thinking about it is, uh, you know, a, a legitimate actor or one that's at least not willing to break terms of service uh, is not necessarily going to go out of their way to build like a huge click farm somewhere, right. right? But that's an option that's available to some of the actors that we're talking about here. Um, I think what I want to understand is like what that market looks like and can we explain the movements in those markets, right? So what I want to know is basically like I want the New York Stock Exchange uh, but for bots, but for fake identities online, right? Like what's the market price on it right now? If I want to go out right now and buy those accounts, how expensive it is to get a good one? Um, and I think that getting a sense of that moving price over time super valuable to know, both because we can predict what people are gonna do, but the second one is we can also see whether or not our interventions are having an effect or not, right? Because we can start saying, okay, look, if we doubled the price of fake identities, mm -hmm. what do we think the, uh, the influence on the space would be? Uh, and are we actually having an Im impact on that, right? Like I think it's important to have that stock ticker, if you will, um, because it also helps us track some of the sort of illegitimate actors or people who are willing to do a little bit more than just kind of play by the rules. All right, let me ask one last question then open it up, which is, um, so, so walk me, suppose I'm a bad actor right mm -hmm. now. I want to, let's pick a disinformation area. I don't know, climate change is a hoax or something sure. like that. 
give me my playbook. <laughs> but now that now that you and, and I, I have, let's say I've got fifty thousand dollars to spend. Yeah, yeah. How would I bet best use that money in order to? Yeah, you know, we, we can think of whether climate change is a hoax, uh, particular medicine, you know, solving yeah. COVID, something like that. One of the interesting things I've been thinking about in that respect is how sort of pressures on these companies have changed the cost profile of engaging in these types of campaigns. So one of the things we've noticed in our research, for instance, is that it's it's actually a lot harder to put bots on Twitter or Facebook than it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, fake identities are just, they're doing a better job like watching after it. And it's in part because of congressional scrutiny, because of regulatory pressure, because of public pressure. Um, but I think the market has changed really, really in like the last 36 months, I feel. And so one of the tactics I would say, if you were, you know, in my consultancy in the IDO of disinformation, I would say, um, well, you know, uh, I think you should probably invest uh, in uh, influencers ultimately, right? Mm -hmm. That basically the fact that it's become technically more difficult to launch fake identities has created more room and made it more economical to simply hire people. And so the labor economics of this is actually becoming more important over time uh, as we go. Um, and I think that's where your dollar would be best spent at the moment. Great. Now let's open it up. Yeah. Uh, hey, thanks. My name is Brad Boyd. I'm a hey. fellow at Uber. Uh, I study national security and emerging technology as well. My, my question is um, this idea of the marketplace is really interesting. Uh, but let's say you take like defense systems. The, the government, by investing in defense, makes it impossible for the average person to sort of participate in defense as well, right? You can't compete with F 35 if you're going to be the innovation technology. So I'm wondering, as do you see as governments invest more and more in the disinformation space, how that skews the market? How do you see that affecting people in their basements or whatever? And does that raise the cost so they can no longer participate in more effectively? Or how do you see that? Yeah. Let me just repeat the question just to, oh, just right. to make sure that the people heard it, which is what to what extent does government investment in disinformation skew the market? Uh, um, both you know, domestic or, or foreign governments and how they would uh, participate in the disinformation economy. Yeah, so two remarks on that. I think one of them would go to, I think what you might call the heterogeneity of government investment in the space. Uh, and then the other one would be its influence on the market. So I have a paper that I'm working on right now, which kind of starts from a very simple observation, which is, well, you look at the 2016 Russian campaign, you're like, this is like largely improvised, really cheap tools, very low tech, you know, there's kind of a part of me that immediately went off and I'm kind of like, but isn't this just kind of like the tradition of Russian military operations? Uh, and I do think that we have sort of become anchored to the way campaigns happen, at least in the United States discussion, to that type of campaign, right? But I think more likely what's going to happen is that it actually turns out that the way different governments engage and invest in this space has a lot to do with how they think about sort of military and intelligence operations overall. So you might imagine other countries that are maybe a little bit more incentivized to invest in like exquisite technologies, really high end stuff, you know, maybe actually they would end up investing in deep fake technologies, right? And I do think that over time we will see different governments and different sort of military intelligence cultures give rise to very different types of flavors of engaging in these campaigns, largely along the lines of that I'm talking about, right? Like what are the tools do they bring? Do they hire people? How big are these operations? Uh, all that kind of stuff. Now you had a second question, which is, okay, now how do we think about the diffusion of those technologies to the public? And I think there's sort of two really interesting things playing out there that I'm keeping my eye on. One of them is basically how the open source environment around this is evolving. So at least in machine learning, right, there's this big debate over, is it unsafe to launch certain models in the open source? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of governments, I think, are like, they want to benefit from those models coming out, right? But I think there's also kind of question of like, can you change those norms in ways that make it more expensive for a government to like acquire those technologies? And then I think the other way around, which is I think what you have in mind is almost like the drone case, right? Which is that you have a government invest until there's economies of scale in doing certain types of things. And those inevitably leak out into the public. And I think it's definitely the case. And that's actually an interesting research project I hadn't considered, which is like, look at all of the, um, look at all of the procurement deals being made by governments in the space, use that to predict what's going to become less expensive in the future and become more widespread going forwards. That's really cool. I hadn't thought about that, but I think it's definitely a route you could go down. So thanks so much for this really interesting talk. Um, I think, uh, as you're saying, it's a really powerful framework to think about the costs and benefits of various activities. So you might, you might actually see it emerging as a real threat. And also, for people for other fields like cybersecurity that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I'm just curious if you have thought about why this kind of economics framework hasn't really taken off in the field of uh, disinformation research so far. Um, 
Sure. Repeat the question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the question is basically like whether or not I have hypotheses for why this framework isn't already more popular. Uh, and I agree with you because in some ways for me, it seems like very intuitive. Um, I think maybe there's two comments back on that. You know, I think one of them is uh, some of it's a little bit of a high wire act, right? Is like, if you do what you say, ultimately you're like, yeah, about next year, we're going to see these, these tactics being tried. Uh, and I think th that's a pretty high stakes way to operate, right? Like if I am a, uh, an enterprising uh, disinformation commentator, uh, my strategy in some ways is to make vague prognostications that I can always say were true afterwards. Um, and that's like a great strategy for me. Um, and so I think one of the reasons that some of this hasn't taken off is that it really forces you to be like this day, this capability, this prediction, um, which I think has been very risky to the space to engage in. Um, in, in part, and to the people's credit, I think in part because a lot of the basic facts haven't been there. Um, I think though, you can think a little bit, you mentioned cyber. I actually think we can almost think about the evolution of discussion around cyber as kind of a parallel to what's happening here, which is maybe that we're gonna eventually get there. It's just gonna take a lot of time for that to occur. Um, and that's because fields are nascent. It takes time for that to occur. It takes time for economists to be like, I can get some PhDs through here. Like I think all those incentives play and kind of shaping where the field goes. And so, you know, I guess I'm confident that this is where things will look like eventually, but it just makes take some time given the sort of historical precedent that we have. Let me uh, go to one question. For, uh, we've got many questions on the Zoom, but let me throw this one out here um, where someone asked, one important piece in the theory of the firm is the price of the product. How are you thinking about the price benefit of disinformation campaigns? Mm, yeah. So this is, yeah, I think the questioner is absolutely right. And I haven't done a whole lot of work on it, but I, what I think it would be really interesting is to kind of be pulling some of the results that we have from social science into thinking about this model, right? Which is, you know, one view on QAnon is QAnon's great content. It's like very engaging. It's just awesome to read. It's like fascinating. It's like a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a augmented reality game. Um, and, and I think we do think, need to think a little bit about that, right? Is sort of like the value of the content being put out and like that moving market, right? So, you know, one of the anecdotes, if it's helpful to the questioner, is in my analysis around deep fakes, I sort of point out that uh, in machine learning, what you need to do is you have to train a model, right? Which is basically like, I want to teach the computer to get good at simulating someone's voice. But that takes time. If you really want to do a good one, it can take weeks, months, depending on how much commuting power you have. That actually puts very interesting pressures on a disinformation actor because you have to basically be able to think about the thing you're going to try to attack prior to training the model. If it's something where it's an emerging news story, it's going to be much cheaper and easier for you to just kind of hire someone to pretend to be someone online. And so there's almost something about like the sort of like cadence at which people engage in things online, which influences the kind of technology I use. Uh, and I think is somewhat related to the ways we could think about price here, the price of the good. Well, I, I suppose that one thing, so taking that most sophisticated kind of example, that if I were an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. right, then, well, I get the, I, I try to do the deep fakes for all mm -hmm. the candidates in yeah. the campaign, all the political leaders, all the influencers, yeah. you know, that I think are going to have an impact. And so you can invest that. It, it's true. I don't know, you know, exactly who is going to be the yeah. most influential mm -hmm. person six, 10 months from now, but... I mean, if it's the president of the United States. Yeah, pretty sure, right, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that would seem to be a Yeah, and I, what I love about where you're going with that, Nate, is basically like, it does it turn out that a lot of SaaS technologies or like a lot of disinformation technologies are just SaaS economics? Mm -hmm. And if so, like, should we imagine the emergence of sort of like dark APIs? Yeah, sure, obviously. It makes sense to eventually offer these services on a platform basis for the same reason that it makes sense to offer these services on a platform basis in, in those sort of like legit arena. Well, and, and this goes back to your, your point before about how open source some of these techniques are. Mm -hmm. Like we're, I, you look at the Dolly um, mm -hmm. uh, image generator, right? It seems, to, and we're kind of there already, at least with, with static uh, uh, pictures. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to videos, I mean, we're, we're gonna get there. Yeah, basically. sure. Um, and so that it may, be, I mean, I guess the most sophisticated ones are, are still many years away, but the, uh, the basic stuff, you, you know, we've got people here in the computer science department doing it every day. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think one weird take on that is um, you can also think about the media hype around some of these capabilities as itself increasing the value to the disinformation actor. Yeah. So this is kind of weird endogeneity here where it's basically like, because everybody's really panicked about deep fakes, does it raise the incentive to launch a deep fake? Because you're likely that people will be like, ah, see, the threat is yeah. happening. We should all be worried about it. And so there actually is these really interesting dynamics, which I think would be very hard to model, uh, which are a little bit about kind of like how reporting on it 
also changes the incentives of the actors. Well, you right? know, that's, yeah. that's, I think, a very important point. And, and, and the folks in the Stanford Internet Observatory and Alex Damos, of course, who was, who was uh, working at Facebook at the time of 2016, will suggest that, you know, the, the, the price of the Russian disinformation campaign in 2016 mm -hmm. was actually quite low. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were using Facebook ads. I mean, talking about $100,000 of Facebook ads. To then, whether it had an in, impact on the election, leave that aside for a second, mm -hmm. It certainly beefed up their reputation as having, you know, credible influence. Sure. Potential. Yeah, and I think you can think about a lot of these campaigns as a kind of venture capital, right? Which is like it's a tiny bit of the overall flow of money into these efforts, uh, but it's kind of just like a side bet that you'd make because it pays out. It's great. Let me go back to the room. There, there was hands uh, right in the back there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Divya. Hey. I'm a grad student in computer science, political science, and research assistant at the Stanford Internet Observatory. My question really has to do with the plan your framework to educational intervention for local media in general to combat misinformation, et cetera. So do you have any comparisons on like um economics of investment like an educational Google advertising for checking sources versus seeing misinformation posts and the economics of sharing those? So let me repeat that, which is, um, what about the economics of what I'll call resilience? How do you how do you think about investments to, I guess, in the audience to make them um, more likely to defeat disinformation campaigns or maybe even raise the price? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I'll admit I actually have not done a whole lot of work on it, um, but I think it's actually really critical for the same reason I guess I'm critiquing the deep fake discussion. Right. And that like we have a lot of discussions that are like, ah, media literacy, it's going to take too long. Media literacy, it's the only solution. And in some ways, it's kind of just a question of just like, does it move the needle on some of these things? Uh, I mean, certainly as a modeling effort, I can just do the classic sort of economic sleight of hand where I'm like, there's a variable that accounts for how resilient people are on this now. Uh, but that would not be very satisfying to me. And maybe I hope it would not be satisfying to you either. Yeah. Uh, next question right over here. I think. Thank you, Professor Wong. My question is about like what it, what are I mean, like publishing or hypothetical scenarios? So how do you think that this information campaign will be looking like? Because my experience at Center International Center is like rather different. I work on China's disinformation campaign regarding the Xinjiang scenario, like Xinjiang question. And it's like instead of like high tech stuff, like they employ like cheap boss, like they outsource the work to third parties, and uh, it's, it's basically just a blogging campaign. And also, like in my personal read, I read about like how startups like trying to synthesize voice, deep fake, like their due diligence for like Wall Street. And this kind of like a non conventional scenario of like this information, how does that impact like some big companies like into your research on when or kind of technology will be involved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Go ahead. I'm, trying to, no, no. I'm not sure I can summarize that. It's great. Why don't you try to summarize that question uh, if you could? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, as I take it, the question is a little bit about like, Effectively, like, what do you predict, right? Like, from these models, like, what do you think things will look like going forwards? So I think maybe there's two things that have been on my mind that I think comes out of the modeling. One is, like, a prediction, and the other one is kind of, like, a, a direction for further work. So I think one prediction is a little bit like we were talking about, is that, like, what we imagine or what we see happening in the SaaS marketplace, right, for, like, Google APIs and stuff, I do really will think will happen in the, the disinformation case, which is that you will see an increasingly large market of sort of third party sort of black market actors that will sort of be able to do sort of turnkey disinformation operations, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's essentially enough expertise that goes into just reliably figuring out how to get bots on Twitter um, that it actually usually typically makes sense to just like go to a specialist. Um, and so I do think that that's one thing we'll see is that the market structure or the market organization will tend to be a lot of governments sort of outsourcing to specialists on particular things that they need. Um, I think the only downside of that is a little bit what you're talking about for the China case, which is to what degree does the actor care that, you know, there's a possibility of a leak, right? One of the reasons for building in-house is that you can keep it to like the 20 people that you're doing the campaign with versus letting it spread more widely. Um, a direction that comes out of the research, though, that I am really interested in is, um, again, going back to the middle manager at the Internet Research Agency, that guy is sometimes trying to influence the world at large, but we should also think about his incentives within the organization as well. And I am really interested in this idea where like Michael Scott is basically like, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to do deep fakes because my boss will be like, yeah, you got a deep fake to show up, you know, in social media. That's awesome. Yeah. Like here's more budget. 
you know, and I do think that weirdly, that is also one thing that has been poorly mapped in this discussion, right, is the degree to which like how much of these campaigns are actually theater for the organization itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually an incredibly valuable way of thinking about why these campaigns engage in some of the behaviors that they do, particularly in a world where the returns are so uncertain that you essentially see what you have in, have in the VC space, right? Which is like blockchain, it's cool. Okay, cool, here's money. Like, I think that also plays out in the, in the disinformation zone, so. So um, here's another question from the, from the Zoom, which is uh, how do you factor in the ad hoc nature of disinformation? There's a lot of throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Do we know what the middle manager thinks, uh, that, that the middle manager thinks is strategically as you suggest, or is it just like, all right, let's you know see what works. And I might amend that to like the example of the Macedonian teenagers mm -hmm. in 2016, yeah. which is like, they were just putting stuff up, sure. you know? And it's like, then they could measure what the impact was based on the ad revenue or the clicks. Yeah. So there's a very interesting uh, parallel discussion that played out in marketing in the mid 2000s, which I think is actually a very helpful way of thinking about what's going on here, which is basically for a period of time, they were like, we're a viral marketing agency, hire us and we'll make sure you go viral on the internet. And it became rapidly obvious that's like very difficult to do that intentionally. And, you know, one way of viewing how to get something to go viral on the internet is simply you buy as many lottery tickets as possible, right? Just like, just keep posting. The more posting, the better. Anything, one of these things might go viral and, and that's what you want. And I think you could see the Macedonian teenagers essentially is converging on the same result, right? That essentially what they found is that unless you really control a state media agency or something like that, it's just better to constantly be sort of like riffing as a way of seeing whether or not you can sort of catch the wave of the discussion at the moment. And so, you know, how the middle manager thinks about it, I think is ultimately in, in an optimizing way, which is, okay, if I have a static strategy, I'm going to propose to my boss and it doesn't work out. I've got a lot on the line, but if I got a bunch of teenagers pushing out a bunch of content and every few weeks I could be like, Hey, check out this thing that went viral. That's like way better for me as a situation. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I wanted to ask a bit more about the theory of the disinformation firm. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, so obviously it's through an economic lens and it applies greatly to like SaaS startups mm -hmm. and that sort of area. Right. But I wanted to ask, what about for state actors? Would you see any limitations to this model in terms of, you know, whether there might be other metrics which might motivate certain people to do disinformation campaigns rather than solely, for example, the price to bottom? Yeah, for sure. Uh, part of your question goes to what do we think the budgets work like here? And that's something where, look, we just don't have a whole lot of visibility. Um, and it's somewhere where like primary source investigation or a leak ends up being like incredibly, incredibly valuable, right? Because imagine a situation where it's like the money is limitless. There is no cost constraint. Then I think it's very difficult to use this kind of model because it all kind of relies on the fact that you have a certain amount of money that you're maximizing. My bet in many cases though, is that a lot of actors are not operating in sort of a not cost constrained, constrained environment. And in fact, to Nate's earlier point, that this is kind of just like a tiny bit of the budget that is in a much larger Intel budget or a much larger defense budget. And so that certainly when it gets down to kind of the mid-level guy, there are uh, there is a need to show that the money is being spent in the right way, um, right way being kind of like an operative term. Um, but, but yeah, I think that that actually is a, a good critique, right? Is you could very much end up in situations where money doesn't appear to be an object or not really in any practical terms. And then I think a lot of these predictions are not going to be as useful there. But I guess implicitly what I'm betting is that that's the edge case versus the norm. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lily. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there was something of the concentration in the geographical of the other working parties. And also, aside from that, how do you think of the same model in that respect? I'm very like, how far is the research? Let me just repeat yeah. that. So, mm -hmm. is there geographic uh, concentration in the market for disinformation, and how do they measure success? So there's a science fiction story I really want to write, which is that it actually turns out that a lot of companies have also outsourced a lot of their anti-disinformation efforts. So I just imagine that like in one city somewhere out there, like across the hall from one another are basically like outsourced people working on both sides of this, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and I do think that's probably the case, right? Like we haven't gone out there and mapped it, but like I think like that's that's likely to be how some of this is emerging, in part because both the platforms and the disinformation actors are maximizing for like cheap cost of labor. Right. And so the geography to put a point on it is like, yeah, you see stuff happening in Southeast Asia, right? Places where the labor is cheap to execute these kinds of campaigns. Now, in terms of measuring effectiveness, again, this is where something like, and I think this is where this is these models are helpful, is that in some ways they help to guide where some of the investigatory efforts should be, right? Which is basically like if I could get a dashboard that that outsourced group is providing to one of these actors, that's like incredibly valuable. 
my assumption is that it's essentially how marketing firms do it, right? It's just like, okay, we got 300 engagements, right? We got 200,000 views. Uh, but I, again, that's, that's supposition. Like, I don't, I don't really know. Um, and I think it's somewhere where there's a lot more work for sort of like primary source investigation. But, but I think that also raises the question about the different motivations of mm -hmm. disinformation actors, right? I mean, that, that sometimes, I mean, depending on whether it's health disinformation or election manipulation or other kinds of uh, narrative you know, libel that you're trying to just take mm -hmm. someone down, you might have different strategies and the economics might be a little bit different. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, in, again, this is like maybe a, a, a rude observation, but it's almost like, um, you know, in ads, right? They're basically like, you're going to pay per impression or pay per click. Right. Um, that is to say, like, are you paid because you got someone to see it or you could get paid some because someone had to engage with it? And I think you could almost think about campaigns falling into those two things as well. It's just the ends are a little bit more, are more nefarious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi there, I'm Victoria. I'm, I'm a graduate economy director. Hi. I'm you talked a lot today about disinformation actors and the cost they face and the people they may in light of those costs. But I wonder, do you consider the individual circumstances in some of these lives that it's going to become a disinformation actor? For example, the kind of thing out of the example, you went from Washington to Seattle and searched and seeking your spare about the kind of thing that you're going to be up, right? Your model I think right now is kind of a messy. Is this information actor then kind of a Are you interested at all in being that exists before that or being that for that? And if so, would you include it in your model? How would you be able to do that? Part of it is to create the econ model to simplify things and use the laws. And in this case, you use kind of the individual individual. Yeah. So this is a question about yeah. sort of the individual motivation uh, to become a disinformation actor. How much of it is, say, an economic decision versus something else? Yeah, I think this in some ways goes to the question that was asked earlier. It's in some ways the psychological equivalent to the question of can you predict operations that have no budget constraint? Right, which is that one thing, one place where this model really breaks down is, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, if you have like an out and out fanatic for which the costs don't matter, right? And so, you know, for instance, this this has played out in the deep deep fake discussion, right? Which actually just turns out that like, um, you know, in the context of uh, intimate relations and people doing revenge porn, you have seen the technology being used, right? And I think the motivations there are less like someone waking up and being like, how much does it cost for me to do this versus, you know, and I think it's just like a much like it's it's a much cruder mechanism for kind of doing prediction for those types of behaviors. So it's not really included with, with what I'm doing here. Um, and, you know, I guess I just kind of accept that. Like, I think it, it has the same limitations as any other economic model. Um, and so I think that's just part of the limitation. Yes. Hi, I'm Linda. I'm from Washington. I'm from Washington. Yes. I was wondering if there's um, possible an emerging gray market for all of mm. the question is, is there an emerging gray market for, for APIs, I guess, that would help out in the dis or that would uh, promote disinformation, right? Yeah. yeah, for sure. I think the gray market may hide pretty closely near the clear market, the legit market in some ways. So uh, particularly in the machine learning space, which is the domain that I'm most familiar with, there are a lot of companies offering sort of audio synthesis, video synthesis, image synthesis, DALI stuff on an API basis, right? And a number of the companies have made a big show about saying, well, we're deploying this technology ethically. We have a lot of review over the APIs. You know, we, we, we please to see who gets access to them, all those sorts of things. Does that open up a room in the marketplace for someone to be like, yeah, yeah, we don't look too closely at who's using our APIs. I think the answer is yes, right? And so I do think the gray market, which is like not an actor that is like, hey, I'm a criminal, are you doing criminal things? Let me help you out. Versus like more of an actor that says, I'm simply willing to look the other way. I think is definitely something that a lot of these companies will face, uh, uh, particularly as the, start the, the startup market becomes less and less healthy, that you can imagine a lot of these companies are like, we got to get business now. And their tendency will be to offer these services without a whole lot of kind of filtration on who's using them. Well, but it, oh, so yeah. Can Yeah. How, how will legislation uh, affect the market? Yeah, that's right. And I think by and large, I think, yes, I think like legislation will be sort of slow to these things in part because I think what we're talking about here is so tactical. 
and like changes very much on kind of like a quarter to quarter or even week to week basis, right? Like when I say like the stock exchange of buying fake identities online, you know, like if that price is going up, the price is going down, it might really change what these actors choose to do. And in some ways it's like moving at a rate, which certainly makes it difficult for legislation to catch up. I, I think some of the agencies might be well, well positioned to do something about it though. Well, but also, I mean, this goes back to why I was sort of pressing at the beginning that you're talking about marketing, <laughs> just marketing writ large, right? I mean, you're talking about the entire economics of information diffusion here as, uh, and this is just a subset of it. So when you talk about the gray market, it's not great. Some, some too, search engine optim optimization is not gray. I mean, that's, you've got billions of dollars that are being thrown into that, uh, that business, let alone the fact that the platforms themselves are essentially that, that this is the product on offer, right? Which is to try to get your message out to as many people as possible and, and to the right people as possible. So I think it, it's very difficult to sort of identify what what the um, you know when the normal modes of marketing somehow are uh, bastardized to the point where we say, all right, this is where they have to you, we have to intervene or this is when we should start worrying about it. Yeah, and I think the, the counter will just be to kind of a question that was asked a little bit earlier about where the sort of cyber aspects of this and the sort of disinformation aspects you know, overlap if you see a distinction at all, right? Which is like, uh, we could we could do a hack and leak campaign where I get all your personal information yeah. and leak it online. At the point of distribution, it's just a comms issue, right? But at the point of hacking, right, right, right. it's like, it's, it's something that no marketing agency might do, at least not sort of legitimate one so we have a question about just the platforms mm -hmm. and, and so so suppose the platforms understood what you're saying uh -huh. um how would would they uh, behave differently in the disinformation fight uh i think you're starting to see some of it again like these companies are so big in some ways it's difficult to say like what the facebook wants or like what the google wants mm -hmm. um but i do meet more and more people who work at these companies who do start to compare the situation to like the spam situation, mm -hmm. right? Which is very much kind of like this economics question, which is like, okay, how do I raise the costs to make it difficult for you to just get end up in someone's inbox? And I think that kind of thinking in some ways is like this weird wormhole. They're like spam pilled. And like now they're thinking about these problems in this domain. So I think, yeah, certainly the companies are starting to think in this direction, if not only because in some ways they have to operationalize a lot of stuff. They have to simply say, well, are we better at taking down these identities than we were a quarter ago? And like, I think that thinking pushes you to these types of frameworks. Well, I, th I think the focus that you have on uh, fake personas, mm -hmm. right? That, that, so that, that's, you know, if you look the way Facebook has moved toward coordinated and authentic behavior, which is now kind of the, been adopted yeah. by the other, other platforms, that it, it's some, it, the way to try to distinguish it from the normal marketing is that there is this kind of deception that's going on, not just in the speech, right? But in the, in the, in the action that the, and the coordination between the different different groups, and so then it would seem that they you know you put all of your effort into trying to unearth that kind of coordination and circumvention of the uh, protections that the platforms have. Yeah, no, totally. And I think in some ways it uh, it has a lot of echoes of you know economic analyses of you know banning things in other types of markets, right? I think a lot of those things play out in the same way. Let me just one last question, uh, which is. Uh, or yeah, did your question there? Yeah. Hi, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, it might cost you a question, but that is our question. Sure. So we talked about Russia, which seems to be a pretty dominant force behind this information campaign. What are the other countries uh, that we should be able to look at? Like other countries, Russia, we're going to really claim that they're going back to the nation. I'm wondering if it's safe. So the first question is, what about other what other countries should we be concerned about? I would I would uh, throw people to the Stanford Internet Observatory's list uh, of, of research that they've done this. And the second is, what do we know about the Michael Scotts of its information? <laughs> yeah, so on the first question, yeah, I, I would kind of do a shout out to the research happening here, right? Like I think anecdotally, right, like Russia's being studied a lot, China's being studied a lot. Um, there's a lot of interesting work being done in some sort of like Mideast campaigns. Um, and so, but, but I think actually we should sort of think about this as like, those are only the ones that researchers have chosen to focus on. Um, really, I think the types of campaigns, the type of tactics that we're thinking about here are just going to be a component of statecraft in the 21st century. So I think in some ways we should open the aperture to be like everybody and why do they engage in these types of efforts? 
Um, and then on the second point, you have a really interesting question about like sort of the labor economics of this. Unfortunately, there's not like a LinkedIn I can work with here to get access on like, what's the career path for someone managing these types of things? Um, but I think it is actually this mix, right? Like, I think it's like computer security people. There are marketers that we've seen get involved in this type of stuff. There's also just like political operatives, randoms, you know, like Macedonian teenagers. Yeah. And, and I think like this whole realm of like the labor economics of disinformation um, is, is pretty understudied. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there. So unfortunately, I don't have many answers, but I do think that like, we desperately need to know what you're talking about, right? Is like, in the labor supply, who is that person, right? Um, and, you know, who are the specialists, right? Like, uh, in the nuclear space, there's famously like AQ Khan, right? Like the specialist that goes around and helps to develop all these um, sort of nuclear programs in different countries. Uh, I think we'll likely see another pattern, a similar pattern here, but sort of like those names and peoples kind of have been identified. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to just announce that our net, we are actually doing a double seminar this week. So we have on Thursday, uh, Joan Donovan and Emily Dreyfus talking about their new book, Meme Wars. So please uh, come for that, both online and here in person uh, for now. Uh, thank you, Tim Watt. Yeah, thank you, everyone.